Uh, Montel, I knew you were going to love this one, my friend. Decided to go a little bit old school. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the NGSE Draft Central podcast. As always, I'm your host, Joshua Zimmer, joined by Mr. Montel Hardy. Montel, what's going on, my brother? Hey, Josh, you know, back after a one-week hiatus, and, you know, I'm ready to do this, man. Let's, let's do it. We got a lot to get to. Obviously, missed a week. Uh, I'm excited. Oh, hey, you know me. Uh, I was a little bit antsy myself. Um, Didn't get my good fix of Montel uh, and our Draft Central stuff in. But, hell, let's get into it right now. Uh, We had a hell of a weekend for college football. A couple of notable shifts in the rankings. We'll obviously get into those here in a little bit in a minute. But, uh, Montel, easily the biggest game of the weekend uh, was Oklahoma-Baylor. And... Before we even get into it, my boy, Mr. Montel Hardy, probably sent out the most fire tweet of the evening on Baker Mayfield, the quarterback for Oklahoma. Montel, oh, that was probably the best tweet I've ever, I've ever seen you tweet in terms of throwing shade. Um, so I had to throw you some props there. Uh, basically said... Uh, Along the lines of what was it, Montel? Baker Mayfield's going to make a great clipboard holder in the NFL. He's got all the makings of a great clipboard holder, uh, and for the for an NFL clipboard holder. So, yeah, you know, I mean, he's a great story. Uh, Oklahoma's obviously had some issues uh, at quarterback, and he's playing good. He's a good character, but he, but Baker Mayfield, in my opinion, fits the mold of that great college quarterback. Great college quarterback that's what baker mayfield is so don't you know let's not get it twisted make it more than it is guys uh mayfield is fun to watch but you know nfl value meh you know not all that hot no i agree but i tell you what he did play well uh very efficient 24 34 270 yards three touchdowns uh the thing that i was surprised about was that they were able to control the pace of that game I expected Baylor to offensively be able to control the pace. And we've talked about it plenty of times. Their defense isn't as suspect as what people give them credit for. Uh, Matter of fact, they have notable guys who could probably go in the top 50 picks, two of them being guys that I love because they're defensive linemen. Uh, Of course, I'm talking about Sean Oakman and Andrew Billings, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Uh, But I I was actually pretty impressed, you know, with how much Oklahoma has jumped since they lost to Texas. Uh, Obviously, they did not look like the number six team in the country, or the number seven team in the country, excuse me, when they played Texas. Uh, They didn't even look like they were going to be a contender for if there ever was a Big 12 championship game, a contender. Uh, But they played real well. Um, Another game that I want to bring up, Montel, me and you talked about this off the air last night, matter of fact, while we were getting ready to decide what we are going to talk about this evening. One loss Stanford, or or, no, excuse me, they were still the number seven team in the country, get beat by the Oregon Ducks. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this was Vernon Adams' best game as a Duck. I mean, feel free to throw shade at me on Twitter if you guys want. Um, I'm pretty used to that by now. But here's the stat line. 10 to 12, 205 yards, two touchdowns. Also had 19 carries for 47 yards. Most importantly, he didn't turn the football over. And when you go in and play a team like that, you can't turn the ball over. They won 38-36. Of course, another guy that I'm not giving enough credit to was DeForest Buckner. And, again, that's another guy we're going to be getting into here a little bit later. As you can tell, we have a little bit of a theme here going with defensive linemen. Buckner played outstanding. Um, And, Montel, again, this was something that me and you talked about, uh, well, actually a couple times since we've kind of first brought him up a little bit, you know, months ago. Mm -hmm. He has developed so much more as a pass rusher over the last four or five weeks. You know, me and you talked about it before when we were doing our pre-stuff that he was a great run defender. You know, in terms of if everybody remembers Eric Armstead from Oregon last year, you know, he was a top 15 pick. 
if you look at DeForest Buckner's stats, you would have been like, who was Eric Armstead? That's how good he was in 2014. However, he didn't show a lick of ability, consistent ability, to be a pass rusher. He has gotten so much better, and I'm telling you right now, guys are going to start clicking on him and realizing that there's a reason why a lot of analysts are putting this guy in the top 15 picks. I would even go on the off and say that if he has a great workout and even has a great pro day and teams kind of like the type of personality that he is, because we know that is something that teams do kind of look at as to how they're going to fit into that team mold or that team culture, he could be a top 10 pick. It all depends on how the draft obviously falls from now until February, you know, how that order ends up. But whew, I tell you what, Buckner is giving himself a very, very good resume of tapes for us to dive into once that comes in. And it showed again this weekend against Stanford. Uh, yeah, no, I agree, John. Uh, Josh, uh, it's funny, you know, I was just thinking about the Forrest Buckner and how he's, you know, evolved over the years and or just over the past two years, of course. And uh, to me, and you can tell me how you feel about this, but it just looks like on a down to down impact, I think uh, his role has, you know, his, his, uh, his, ability and his talent level seems to show a little bit more. I think last year we saw more flashes and glimpses. Uh, production was there last year too, but this year production is also great, and it seems like every single play, you know, it's a fight. You know, if you do not double team this dude, he will ruin you, you know, and uh, you know, I, I call Sean Oakman the bully of the South. I, I think uh, DeForest Buckner's the bully of the West. You know, like these guys, both of them are nasty. Both of them are taller dudes. But uh, Buckner especially surprised me with uh, not just the production, but the play-to-play uh, just effect he has on the game. And sometimes there are double teams that cannot uh, can't hang with this dude. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's impressive. Yeah, most definitely, and I agree with you 100%. You know, obviously, I watched a lot of Eric Armstead last year because uh, if nobody knows my personality by now, I love watching and evaluating defensive line talent. And there was, I mean, you couldn't go a play without seeing Buckner flash. There was some sort of play throughout an entire game where Buckner flashed two or three times. But where he always flashed was in the run game. This year, you said it perfectly. He's become more consistent in the run game, but he's also developed a repertoire as a pass rusher. He's actually learned that when you're 6'7", 290 pounds, you have a little bit of leverage to use there, and he has found out how to use his hands properly. And I credit the defensive line coach at Oregon or whoever's been working with him, or maybe it just clicked on his own. It's hard to tell. I know there's a little bit of both that can kind of go into that. But he has done a phenomenal job, and he's only been getting better. But looking at another game, Montel, you know, we talked about one Big 12 matchup. Well, there was another Big 12 matchup that I don't necessarily think people were expecting, and that was Oklahoma State versus Iowa State. Now, if all you guys on Draft Nation or a part of Draft Nation right now, if you guys have pens and paper, take notes because I'm going to definitely refer to this when I get on to my rant here very, very soon. Iowa State, when was the last time that they have been relevant in college football? Don't worry, I'll wait. It's okay, they haven't. They have not been a relevant football team. However, they have been playing solid football. They have been playing very competitive. You know, you look at the Iowa game. They led the Iowa game for two drives. You know, they played very close to Texas. They played very close to TCU. 35 to 24 against Baylor. I did not expect for a team that everybody wanted to put in front of Iowa, I did not expect Oklahoma State to come out and play like that. I was actually a little bit disappointed because I wanted to see if there was going to be a team, particularly in Oklahoma, or maybe the Baylor, if Baylor put out a big win against Oklahoma, Mm -hmm. or Oklahoma Mm -hmm. State. Well, yeah. See if they could jump mm -hmm. Iowa, and they didn't. They had to come down from 21-0, and they only win by four points. You know, and the biggest thing about this, the biggest thing about this is if you look at all the games that Oklahoma State has played, the one place defensively that they have struggled 
is in the running game, and I really do believe that Iowa State kind of exposed what you can do to them in the running game. Their quarterback had 193 yards rushing to go on top of 10 of 24 for 224 yards in one touchdown pass. So, I mean, we're, I, we're going to get into it a little bit more, but I was extremely disappointed by Oklahoma State's performance. Uh, say that you, you cut out a little bit, Josh. Say, say that again. Yeah, uh, I apologize about that. I said I was really disappointed about how they played. Well, I, you know, I would be too. And I think as you get into the second half of the season here, or that second or that final quarter, this final stretch of games, it becomes a battle of attrition. And that's kind of one of the issues I think you're going to see with the college football playoff is if you're going to have such an, such a big time playoff after the regular season and conference championship, you're talking about uh, about an NFL schedule. You're talking about 16 games. Um, it's a lot. And sometimes you're going to see these things, Josh. You see people, you know, mentally you're going to get complacent and some things that you didn't expect to happen are going to happen. Uh, people are beat up. Uh, the truth is, even if you prepare and you get these guys fired up and ready to go, uh, it's a it's a long season. Um, some of these younger guys, uh, your body can break down, especially if you're one of those coaches that that practice hard. Uh, so you might see some more abnormalities. I guess that's what I'm saying. You're gonna see some more teams go out there and maybe you know sleepwalk through some games. We've seen it a little bit from Ohio State, who, by the way, I'm telling you right now, uh, the trap game for them is Michigan. I think Michigan State's going to play them tough for about three quarters. I think Ohio State pulls away. But just watch. They're going to walk into that Michigan game. They might walk in a little too cocky. And I'm not saying they'll lose, but I'm saying it, it's, a, it's a serious possibility. So Definitely. I'm getting uh, – Logan, part of Draft Nation, I'm telling you what, you hate Iowa, but you're going to have to listen to what I have to say about – the Hawkeyes, and maybe I'll shed a little bit of light. So please stay tuned. It's going to come in in like one more game. The final game I want to talk to you about, Montel, is a team that kind of like in Iowa, but obviously very and vastly underrated, is a Houston team. A 10-0 and Houston Cougars team was down 20-7 to at half to come back and win 35-34 against Memphis and your draft crush of the year in Paxton Lynch. Now, I understand that it's the Houston Cougars and not the Iowa Hawkeyes who are part of the Big Ten or even the Pac, you know, some of those Pac-12s that we were talking about that were undefeated earlier in the year, or even maybe some SEC schools. They don't play in that type of conference. However, Montel, they were, what, 20th this year or this, this weekend? Do you believe that yeah. after this win, and obviously the rankings came out, you know, we're not going to get into the entire rankings, so I'm mm-hmm. going to peek mm-hmm. a little bit now. Ranking came out, they came out number 20 as a 10-0 and team. Do you believe that that's a little bit, that's a little bit of shade on their part? Since, I mean, they are an undefeated school, and they've been doing it impressively, I might add. They've been putting up nearly 50 points a game. I believe they're, what, only two – it was Baylor's the number one school in the country. I believe Houston is number three in the country in terms of points and uh, yards per game, but yet they're ranked yeah. 20. No, you you got it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a strength of schedule, and you're going to see some issues here because what's going to happen is right now Notre Dame, you know, they still got to play Stanford. That's going to be a big game. But right now one of Notre Dame's best wins is, is, is Navy. So... Um, and the funny part is uh, Houston will play Navy in a couple weeks. And so you look at where Houston is, you look at where Notre Dame is. I mean, consider how Notre Dame, in my opinion, still isn't really in a conference. It's uh, You get a, a solid amount of bias, and, and I think that's what you're seeing. And I know they don't like to weigh in history and those types of things, but it becomes evident uh, anytime Houston is rated so low. Houston doesn't have to be top four, but they, you know, they're, they're hurting you know, as low as they are with an undefeated schedule and an American conference that is, uh, I think, so criminally underrated. 
there are some very good players, Josh. You, we've talked about it. There are some guys in here that can really play. There's some teams in here with some good coaches that are under uh, recognized and underappreciated. So uh, it's uh, it's a shame. But I would say for for Houston, if they win out, they can make it interesting. But they're going to need a whole lot of help. Yeah, hey, Montel, I completely agree with you. You know what? We'll, we're going to take our break five minutes early so that we can get into this rant, and so it can be a full-fledged rant so we don't have to worry about breaking up our college football power rankings. Whatever Where are we want. going into? What are we, what are we doing we're next? Throw into a, we'll throw it into a quick break, and then when we come back from the break, we will immediately do the college football playoffs. So, Montel, uh, go ahead and hit us with an NGSC Sports update. Of course. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Montel Hardy. This is an NGSE Sports News Break. Uh, once again, you can listen to the show online. Just go to NGSESports.com. You can click on the uh, Shows tab and then go to NGSE Draft Central. There are our, all our archive shows. You can take a look here, take a look there, and uh, kind of get uh, into uh, the mix here and listen to our shows. In the news now... Chicago Cubs pitcher Jake Arrieta won the National League Cy Young Award on Wednesday after going 22-6 and six with a 1.77 ERA in 2015. Arietta overtook early favorite Zach Greinke by winning his final 13 starts. Uh, his second half included a no-hitter in August against the Los Angeles Dodgers with the other two finalists for Cy Young versus Grank- Greinke, Zach Greinke, and uh, Clayton Kershaw watching from the other dugout. Overall, Arietta struck out 236 in a career-high 229 innings while leading the league in wins, complete games, and also shutouts with three shutouts on the year. Uh, that's also four complete games. He also gave up the fewest hits, 5.9, and home runs, 0.4, per nine innings. Uh, right now is a good time to check out the NGSC homepage. We have plenty of awesome stories for you tonight. Check out Beating Vegas, Entry 10 by G. Stelio. This is a uh, mostly article that covers the spread, covers gambling. You can check into that and uh, see, you know, what the spread and what the over-under looks like for the following college football season. Also, another article is Derek Carr is the answer in Oakland. This is written by NGSE's own Seth Mowat. This covers Derek Carr's rise to power in Oakland. He is having a phenomenal season. I'm sure we all know. Once again, you can check out these stories and so many more at NGSCSports.com. Once again, you're listening to the NGSC Weekly Draft Central Podcast here on NGSC Sports Radio, available on iHeart, Spreaker, and iTunes. I'm Alto Hardy. Back to you, Josh. Josh, you, you still there, buddy? Why am I ranting, you ask? Uh, I apologize to Montel. I was on mute there, folks. Um, but ah, okay. I yeah. hear it again. Um, as we're talking, the college football playoff rankings, Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, Notre Dame were four. First out would be Iowa, Oklahoma State. Now, again, why am I ranting? Why am I throwing a pissy fit? Because – the, the rankings didn't change within the top five. Well, let me tell you why. I listened to Mr. Joe Klatt today, and if you guys don't know who Joe Klatt is, he is a announcer, broadcaster, and sports analyst, particularly within college football for Fox Sports. And he was on the herd today talking about Oklahoma State University and how he feels that they are being hosed. Now, and I quote, he said, Oklahoma State has one win that is more recognizable than Iowa and Ohio State combined. Let me say that again. Iowa, an undefeated team, and Ohio State combined. Let me tell you something, Mr. Clapp. Since you obviously didn't do your research, let me tell you. 
the teams that Oklahoma State has played combined do not have a winning record. Matter of fact, the only team that has a winning record that they have played this year is TCU. Iowa, on the other hand, has played two top 25 schools that also remain in the top 25, both of them being on the road. And let me throw it in there. They haven't done that since 2007. They are number five in run defense. They are also number five in the strength of record. And let me throw this out there because this is actually a surprising stat. They have not trailed in a college football game this season since the third drive, not quarter, third drive against Iowa State. That was week three. We are now heading into week 11. So let me tell you this. To say that Oklahoma State deserves to be in the top four over an Iowa team that has played two top 25 schools, one of them being a blowout in a statement, the other one being their first since 2007, and have continually continued to show that they are an improved football team and a balanced football team at that, you're ridiculous. Now, is it is it Oklahoma State's fault that the Big 12 sucks this year? No, it isn't. But that's logic. I'm sorry. We'll find out in two weeks just how good they are when they go play in Bedlam against Oklahoma, which, as you can tell, I'm picking Oklahoma. But right now, please, for the – for the, the sake of the game, everybody needs to take notice that whether you like it or not, Iowa is an undefeated team that have played quality football teams all year long. You can make an argument with me. My Twitter handle is jzimmer underscore NFL. I'll gladly show you to the light in that they deserve to be the top five team in the country. Now, they play Purdue this weekend. Should be a walk game. You never know. Could be a trap game. We'll find out on Saturday. Then they play Nebraska. Same deal. If they go undefeated and they beat Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game, this rant will obviously have been for nothing because they would be 13-0, and beat the defending national champions. That's an automatic shoe-in. And in my opinion, it'd be an automatic shoe-in over Alabama. doesn't matter if Alabama wins the SEC or not. Iowa would be undefeated and defended – the national champions. They'd be the number two team in the country. Now, I'm going to try and, and get off my rant and get Montel back into this. Yeah, so let's I, uh, yeah, let's go here. ahead and put the kibosh yeah. on that. Uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, there's only so many um, Iowa Hawkeye fans here. So, uh, you know, I, I get it. Trust me, I get it. They wronged you. You know they wronged you. But the oh, wins they, are there. They, 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 the wins are there. That's the most important part. There are some teams uh, like uh, Houston, maybe like Stanford, where um, there's no coming back. You took too many losses or your schedule doesn't bear you another uh, important victory that can put you back in a race. So their, their race is finished. It's over. Really? I was, you know, it's just began. So, yeah, like I said, I think the wins are there, and I wouldn't stress out too much about it. And it looks like we got some more stuff to get to today. Yeah, of course. And, you know, as you said, you know, the biggest thing is that if they lose out, you know, if they lose to Purdue, it doesn't matter if they beat Ohio State, their chances are gone. Um, and we know that. Uh, but obviously, um, that was my rant. We already know who's in the top four for this week. But we're going to go into the future a little bit. Montel, it's time for us to play a little bit of college pick em. We are going to pick and predict our final four. Okay, because I'm looking at the schedule. I thought we had uh, fantasy coming up next. Is that is that not a thing, or what are you? What are you? I mean, we're going to go right into uh, what's yep, next. Going, okay, yep, cool. We're go right into. Uh, we're going to go into picking and predicting. We'll go okay. right into picking and predicting. All right. What's what's the first game? Let's do it. So, we have to figure out who our top four is going to be. Um, since I took a lot of the airtime previously, Montel, I'll go ahead and turn it to you first. If we had, if me and you were on the committee, if we were the only two on the committee, and we had to decide who was going to be in the final four for the playoff, 
Montel, who would your four teams be? And then why? Uh, well, excellent question. Uh, there's some things that still need to be figured out, but uh, as it stands right now with the games I have, uh, I probably, let's see here, A, I'd put Ohio State in there. I think they're on the table. They got to do it. I'd bump them up a little bit and just see where it goes. B, I think Alabama has won the, uh, assuming they win the SEC East, I think they're in and they're definitely in. Uh, three, I've got Clemson, and I think uh, they finally turned the corner. They got the type of players to do it, and I'm, you know, I'm ready to see it, guys. So, um, you know, I think Clemson in the Final Four should be a thing. Uh, also, uh, what else? As far as the fourth team goes, it's going to be tough. It, it really is. So I'm not going to put a Pac-12 team in there. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And I'm also not putting Notre Dame in there because I think they'll either lose to Stanford or even so I don't think their schedule will, will stand the test of time. I think I think I'm going to go ahead and give it to Oklahoma State. I say they do it. You know, they, they beat Baylor. I don't think they'll blow it. I don't know why, but I'll say they don't blow it. And uh, I think that'll be that fourth team. I think that fourth team has to be a big 12 team. I like them over – uh, uh, Notre Dame team because otherwise the committee would be screw- screwing over the Big 12 t- twice, two years in a row, especially if uh, if uh, Oklahoma State wins out. So those are my four. You know, and, and I, I can respect that. Uh, you know, I do believe that obviously Ohio State is the team to knock off. Alabama, I mean, I believe that they're going to run away with the SEC. We already know about their not only their track record, but their tradition, they're going to be in there. Uh, completely agree with you on Clemson, though. I think Clemson, if that is the Final Four, Clemson's my wild card team to actually win it because I believe that they have a better offense than Ohio State when they're completely clicking. doesn't matter that Ohio State may have more athletes. And I believe that in terms of their defense, their defense will fit well because of the vast majority of what they see in the ACC. It's not like the Big Ten where it's you see a little bit of spread and then you see majority power run, or it's not like the Pac-12 where it's completely spread. The ACC is balanced. You see those power triple option teams. You'll see those traditional power, you know, West Coast type offenses where you have to operate under center. But then we also see those spread offenses. And you can go back and look at every box score and every stat from this game so far this season. Clemson has played very, very well. And so I think their defense is going to be the key. Not to mention the fact they probably have three players on that team that are going to be first-round picks on that defense alone. You know, in, in Shaq Lawson, Mackenzie Alexander, who's a corner that everybody loves right now as a, as a redshirt sophomore. And then, of course, Jalen Curse is a safety. Um, so I think they might have the best defense of that Final Four if that was your Final Four. Now, here's my final four. I do believe Clemson's going to win it. I think Clemson's going to stay my number one team. Uh, I personally believe uh, that Ohio State is going to get pushed in their last two games. Michigan State's going to take them to the wire, and you're also going to see that Michigan's going to take them to the wire as well. Um, I do believe that defensively, though, I mean, when you got a guy like Joey Boza, and you got Darren Lee at linebacker and Adolphus Washington on that defensive line, it makes it very hard to be an effective offense. And we've seen it this year that offenses haven't been very effective against Ohio State's defense. So I I like Ohio State to go to the Big Ten championship game. Now, I would put in Iowa, and here's the reason why. Yeah, Iowa hasn't seen a defense like Ohio State yet, but they've played manageable defenses that can compare. You look at a Northwestern defense that shut down a Stanford offense, they played pretty darn well. I mean, they put 40 points on the board. You look at Minnesota's defense, who held Ohio State to only 24 points. The the big key here is that Ohio State's offense hasn't seen the defense that Iowa has. And I don't even think that Ezekiel Elliott has seen a front seven that Iowa has had so far this year. As I've said before, they only, they're only they fifth in the country right now in run defense, allowing 71 mm-hmm. yards. And they currently have only given up four rushing touchdowns all year. Uh, that's basically a two-game spread for Ezekiel Elliott. 
uh, who's a freak in his own right. Um, but I believe it's going to come down to the kicking game. And, I mean, you know, Kane's been pretty damn good for Iowa. I think that if Iowa has to kick a field goal to win it, Iowa's in. So Iowa would be my number three team. And then for number four, I'm going to go – I would go Oklahoma. And here's why. I think that we saw – what truly this team is all about defensively against Baylor. You look at Oklahoma State's offense, the way they operate is very similar to Baylor, fast-paced, not a whole lot of very complex route trees. Baylor got it, you know, Baylor got it handed to them. And, you know, it was a very physical game. They had a struggle to run the football. Um, And I think that with the game being just how hyped it's going to be, I think Bob Stoots is going to pull, you know, he's going to have some tricks up his sleeve. He'll be able to win that game. I also believe. We'll see. We'll see. But I also agree with you, Montel, that Notre Dame is going to lose to Stanford. I, I do believe in that. It doesn't matter that Stan, Stanford, I'll say this right now. You guys can, again, you can, and even Montel, feel free to get come after me. I – firmly believe that Stanford is the best two loss team in the entire country right now. Adamantly believe that Stanford is the best two loss team in the country. You know, their losses came to, they were battle games, but they are also on the road. You look at LSU, you know, they weren't close losses. They were blowouts. What was it? 30, 34 to three against Alabama. And then it was thirty-one to fourteen against Arkansas. You know, I yeah. adamantly believe that Stanford is the best two-loss team in the country, and I don't think Notre Dame is going to be able to do anything to them. It might be a similar message mm-hmm. of what we've seen with them at Clemson. You know, and as they always say, yeah. the third time's the charm. They've only been in that game twice, so they're going to lose that game. At least I'm hoping because low-key, I don't like Notre Dame. Um, so, so that's that, you know, to be, to, to be completely honest about it. Um, but as we, uh, as we move forward, Montel, um, you know, the, I, I want to ask you a little bit about this. Um, obviously this is going to be more of a, you know, beer glass type round table discussion, but who is your Heisman front runner right now? Good. I, I was hoping that we, you know, we transition a little bit here because it seems like we had the the playoff pretty, you know, thoroughly covered. Uh, but you know, as we get into Heisman talk here, you know, I can't stress it enough. Uh, no one really is. I mean, with everything that's going on, no one has seemed to appreciate Ezekiel Elliott as enough as as much as I think that he he deserves. Given the state that Ohio, you know, that that the Buckeyes have been in offensively. Earlier in the season, uh, in flux between Cardell and uh, JT, they had some issues. Uh, without Ezekiel putting up the numbers he did, getting the touchdowns he did, I don't think they win those games. And you'll see Saturday when they play Michigan State, you'll see Ezekiel show up big again. I know he's losing ground to Derrick Henry, who's playing you know out of his mind. Uh, Fournette's probably still in the running. Uh, I don't know how that's going. Uh, some people might even give Baker Mayfield an invite, but I hope we're not going to kid ourselves here. But um, you know, it's uh, I, I don't I don't think people really appreciate how uh, how important that Ezekiel Elliott is to Ohio State's offense. Look at how many games they've won in a row, and then look at his numbers. There's a correlation. Okay, it's, it, there's no coincidence. So, uh, as far as Heisman candidates, right now Ezekiel Elliott's my number one. I don't care, be angry if you want to. Derrick Henry's my number two. So hopefully you're less mad at me. Number three, I really like uh, who else? Uh, well, I, I really like what Devontae Buckers did at Utah, but because they've lost, they might put him out of it. Uh, I would say Corey Coleman. I think he gets an invite too. Uh, maybe he's not my number three. He'll be my number four. Uh, and then. Uh, at five, just to be fun, just to be funny, I'll give uh, I'll give Baker Mayfield an invite because you know there's always that guy who goes to the Heisman uh, award ceremony. He only gets like two first place votes, but you know that that'll be um, that'll be a good move. Okay, okay. How about this though? 
How about Keegan Reynolds? The all-time NCAA leader in rushing touchdowns. Uh, Keegan Reynolds. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy who's balled out too, um, but I, I don't know, man. I mean, you look at all these running backs. I mean, okay, this but, will be fine. This will just be the first time ever I think we've had, like, all running backs as high as been fine. Oh, he's a, he's, a, he's a quarterback. He's the oh, quarterback. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, tell me QB. more. Yeah, he's the he's the quarterback for the University of Navy. And this past weekend, he broke the all-time rushing record. Oh, the, Keenan hey. Reynolds. I thought you said, yeah. like, Keegan Reynolds. I'm sorry. Oh, he, um, no, Keenan Reynolds. But the thing is, is <laughs> that, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to use your example just because not because I'm going to try and, and bash you, but because I've actually seen examples like that. Guys would rather have Baker Mayfield over a guy who's actually been damn good all year. He's the reason why the Naval Academy is where they're at, which is 19th in the country. Yeah, they lost to, to Notre Dame. But after that, they've been running the table all year long. And he's been doing nothing but scoring touchdowns all year long. Silently, the only reason I believe that he's not in the discussion thoroughly is because he plays at the Naval Academy. It'd be, you know, here here would be an example. What about even Charlie Ward from Houston? An undefeated school. Uh, he's well, yeah. Killed. yeah. He would be a guy, in my opinion, would get an invite over a Leonard Fournette, over a Baker Mayfield. But those are two guys so far this year that because of the level of competition that we play, basically what we've talked about with the college football playoff, you know, playoffs with the with the level of competition that they play, they're getting overlooked. But when you go back and look at Charlie Ward's stats, the fact that he has a – obviously he has a hand in every touchdown in some sort of fashion offensively that they score, whether he throws it or he hands the ball off. But the fact of the matter is, is that Charlie Ward and Keenan Reynolds have been balling. And I'm not going to take anything away from Ezekiel Elliott because he has been phenomenal this year as well, and Henry has been awesome down the stretch. If I – had the opportunity or the power to do so, this would probably be the year where you can invite four Heisman finalists. Normally we've seen, we've seen three the last couple of years. You know, last year it was Mariota, Gordon, and Cooper. I do believe that when it's all said and done and we get ready for the Heisman Trophy, that it should be Derrick Henry, Ezekiel Elliott, if – Houston is undefeated, Charlie Ward, and if Navy runs the table, Keenan Reynolds. That, I mean, that would probably be, because you also look at it too, can you imagine the storyline, and we know about it, I mean, hell, we're in the media, can you imagine the storyline that would develop if that actually happened? That would be a hell of a storyline to pay attention pay attention to the entire week. And the best part is, is that it's, it's giving programs that don't get enough publicity in terms of the primetime spotlight to help them recruit. Now, guys who go to the Naval Academy obviously understand about the commitment to yeah. serve over the fact that they can go play in the NFL. You're going to the Navy, you're going to the Naval Academy to get an education and to serve your country when you're done, then you can play in the NFL. It's not like where, you know, you go to Alabama or go to Houston or any other of those schools, you play your three or four years and then you can opt out into the draft or just get a normal day job and work 80 hours a week. Um, But Mm -hmm. it still takes time and it still takes publicity to try and recruit players to that program. And out of all three of the Armed Forces Universe, you know, academies, you know, the Arm, you know, West Point, the Air Force Academy, in the Naval Academy, this would bring a little bit, because you all, you know, not going to steal any shade from the Air Force either. Air Force is having a pretty good year in the Mountain West. But these types of moments would help the recruiting process for that school. And the same thing would be for Houston. 
It would help with that school. It would help recruits under that aren't in the Houston area or aren't in Texas. Because we all know it's harder than hell to steal a recruit from Texas if they don't go Division One, Or if you're not a Division One school because they'll be like, oh, I'll just walk on at the 50,000 Division One schools this state has. But it would help Houston get a foothold in recruiting, which is something that they haven't been able to do in Texas since they've been Division I. So. Yeah. Um, you know, you know moving the focus more back to football, because um, we kind of went on a rant there about the Navy. But, um, you no, know, I, I think he's uh, going to be deserving. He's done a whole lot. It'll be interesting, though, because this is a guy that's been in a primarily rushing offense, and I don't know in today's NFL, you know, today's NFL, and in today's college football landscape, that they would give the Heisman to a quarterback, uh, though his quarterbacking numbers are, you know, simply not very sufficient. So uh, I, I don't think he'll get the invite. I don't think he'll win the award, but they'll probably give him like a Davey O'Brien or a Walter Camp award or something like that. But I, I don't think Heisman is his thing. But that's the biggest thing is we're, we're, we're starting to lose focus of what the Heisman Trophy stands for. It doesn't stand for the best quarterback. It stands that's for the you, best player. Do you honestly believe exactly that the quarterback the position, no one's ever – do you honestly believe, be it at any position, no one this year is, is as deserving as him? If you look at his I, level of competition and you look at his productivity coming – but, but that's the thing is we have to put that aside. When you look at the fact that he broke the all-time record and the career that he had at Navy and the season he's having at Navy while doing so, you have to put that into account. Look at his rushing yards and look at Derrick Henry's. Look at Ezekiel Elliott's. Yeah, look at him. If it's comparable and he's a quarterback without any passing yards, he's not going to win, Josh. Now, if he was putting up – you know, Jameis Winston passing numbers, you know, special passing numbers, even mediocre passing numbers, that's great. But this is a primarily rushing quarterback who touches the ball more than the running backs he's competing against and still is not a clear first. So I, I don't think Navy's quarterback is going to win the Heisman. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, no, I'm not not saying, no, I'm not saying he's going to win the Heisman, but what I'm saying is that we have to get away from the fact that just because he plays quarterback, that that solely is the reason why he should win the award. Oh, his quarterback stats are great, so he, yeah, he wins the award. You know, it would have been going off of, you know, I mean, we look at Michael Vick, who was a Heisman finalist. You know, when, when he was a Heisman finalist, his passing stats were not near as good as some of the other quarterbacks in the entire country that year. But it was because he was running for 1,200 yards and 24 touchdowns. So we have to get away from when this award stands for the best overall player. It's the best overall player. It doesn't matter if you run the ball. doesn't matter if you throw the ball. doesn't matter if you catch the ball. Like in my opinion last year, I believed that Amari Cooper should have won the award. His stats, well, when you look at his stats and you look at what he did, it was way better in terms of overall performance which is what we look for, than Melvin Gordon or Marcus Mariota. Because you also got to remember, too, Melvin Gordon didn't break the record until the bowl game. So he was still sitting at, you know, 1,900 yards or 1,800 yards rushing. When Amari Cooper had, like, what, 1,500 yards receiving? Or 11, was it, was it, yeah, wasn't it 1,500 yards receiving as a junior? So... Uh, I mean, that's the only, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that Keenan Reynolds is going to win the Heisman. I would be crazy to think so because of everything that you said. Derrick Henry, Ezekiel Elliott, those are the only two words that you need to say, mm-hmm. and that's what everybody's going to talk about. But we have to just make sure that this overall, com, you know, complicity of the award doesn't get based on what necessarily they play, but how they play. Even as a runner, I cannot say he is uh, – I mean, he's been great, but you look at what Derrick Henry's done, you look at what Leonard Fournette's done, you look at what Ezekiel Elliott's done, and Reynolds is still number four. Um, if you're arguing that he should get an invite, fine, uh, invite him. Like I said, there's always that guy who goes who doesn't really have a shot at winning it at all. But he, he's just there, but – 
Um, he's had a phenomenal year, okay? Uh, but in college football, there are guys who have record-breaking years and end up short of a national title, end up short of a Heisman. I think Reynolds will find a – he'll have a postseason award or two. Uh, but, I, you know, from a Heisman standpoint, uh, it's just – the competition is just too thick this year. It's just too deep. Uh, and it's uh, it's going to be fun to see how it unfolds. I still don't know who's going to win. We don't. We both don't, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I think that's what we'll see in the coming weeks. Yeah, like I said, I completely agree with you. And, you know, in the spirit of in the spirit of good radio, it's worth arguing about. Um, but, uh, no, I completely agree with you. Uh, these next three weeks are going to be extremely fun to watch play out. And uh, I can only hope that, hell, right now, Draft Nation, you heard it first. Why not? I'll start the Keenan Rental Heisman campaign. I'll, I'll I'll get some graphic designers together and we'll make a really cool thing and I'll turn it into my Twitter profile and I'll spread Keenan Reynolds' awareness to get him voted and get him into New York. Just for the fun of it. Because I think it would be great to see uh, somebody from the Naval Academy nominated for the award at least. Because um, it's been certainly quite some time since we've had somebody – uh, from one of the armed forces academies nominated for an award like that. Uh, but uh, as we get into this, folks, Montel, I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to you. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about our top five D linemen and our top five edge rushers. And we're also going to start prematurely talking about the senior bowl as the initial list of invites acceptances have been posted, but there's also some invites out there who haven't been accepted yet. And so we'll talk about who we think should accept them uh, coming up here in about a co- in a couple of minutes. So Montel, go ahead and take it away. Sure, Josh. Uh, thank you. And uh, once again, everyone, this is Ed. NGSC Sports News Break. Uh, just a reminder, you can listen in at NGSCSports.com. This is the NFL Draft Central, uh, NGSC Draft Central uh, podcast. You can listen online on our show page. Just go to the NGSC Draft Central Weekly tab and listen to us and all our archive shows. In the news now, Cubs pitcher Jake Arrieta won the National League Cy Young Award on Wednesday after going 22-6 and with a 1.77 ERA in 2015. Arrieta, took, he overtook early favorite Zach Greinke by winning his final 13 starts. His second half of the season included a no-hitter in August against the Dodgers, along with, along with the record-breaking season he Finished with 230, or I'm sorry, yeah, 236 strikeouts and 229 innings while leading the league in wins, complete games, and shutouts. He also gave up the fewest hits, 5.9 per game, fewest home runs, 0.4 per nine innings. You can check out the articles, the information, and the news stories. Uh, the well, at least the latest ones here at NGSCSports.com. Derek Carr is the answer in Oakland. That is the uh, new article written by NGSC's own Seth Moed that covers Derek Carr and his rise to power in Oakland in a uh, in, in what looks to uh, part of an epic season for the Oakland Raiders. Uh, also, by a vowel, Heisman and Playoff Talk, written by NGSE's college football writer, Lee Val. You can read that and check in on any Heisman talk, as well as CFB playoff predictions. Uh, as always, you can check out these uh, awesome articles and so many more at NGSCSports.com. Once again, you're listening to the NGSC Weekly Draft Central Podcast here on NGSC Sports Radio, available on iHeart, Spreaker, and iTunes. I'm Alto Hardy. Back to you, Josh. Awesome, Montel. Thank you very much, my friend. I appreciate that. So, you know, as you can tell, I'm, I'm, yeah, 
Folks on Periscope, you can't hear it, but I'm going to oh. tell what I got. A little bit of sublime. Uh, trying to lighten the mood a little bit, get a little bit of that reggae going. Uh, all right, but hey, let's get into it now, Montel. Uh, this is what I've been actually, uh, <laughs> whether how feisty I've been earlier in the show or not, this, I've actually been waiting for this the most. Um, it's time we get into our top five defensive front four prospects. And the reason I say front four is because I'm sure if Montel is anything like me, which I know we do kind of think a little bit alike, um, I'm sure he's going to throw some, some edge rusher love in there as well. Uh, but first things first, Montel, obviously this class is damn talented. It's probably, in my opinion, deeper than what we saw last year in terms of interior defensive linemen. And as these edge guys are probably going to be more of your cream of the crop, you know, top dollar type guys, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of spread uh, with in terms of those elite guys from those third, fourth round picks type guys. Um, but let's get into it first. You know, let's get into the defensive tackles. Um, you know, my top five was a little was a little difficult. I'm not going to lie to you um, because it's just so good, dude. The defensive interior defensive line class this year is so deep and can go in any other direction that, quite frankly, I don't know if we could be wrong had I've done this a hundred times. Uh, but number one, I put Robert Kimdichie easily. This dude is a three technique. All this talk of him being a five is is great and all, but I, I believe that with his reach, with his athleticism, you know, he can develop – into a pretty solid three technique. I like him as a three technique actually quite a bit. Number two is my guy from UCLA, Kenny Clark. Uh, this dude's a tank. Uh, you want to watch a guy who can just absolutely overpower opposing offensive linemen in a pass rush? Kenny Clark is your guy. I was watching the Stanford game uh, the other night, and he – practically folded the center on top of Kevin Hogan's lap as he was getting ready to throw the football. Um, number three, I'm going to save number three. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to save this in a sec, Montel. Uh, but number four is Andrew Billings. Now, Billings could potentially be higher on my list, but there's rumors going around right now that he has already decided to stay as a senior. Obviously, if that changes – He's probably going to be a top, you know, top ten guy, um, in my opinion. And then number five, Ashawn Robinson from Alabama. Um, the dude's a little bit more athletic than I think what everybody has given him credit for so far. Um, he can move pretty well. He has really solid hands. He's a true nose guard, in my opinion. I don't care what everybody's saying about oh, he lost weight. He can play three technique. No, he can't. He's a true nose. His feet are a little bit slower. Um, but that's my top five. Um, but Montel, you want to hear, you want to know about my number three? Glad you asked. Sheldon. Sure, Day, yeah. Tell me about your top three. Give me a he's, third. he's my, this is my wild card. So this is why I saved it. Sheldon Day from Notre Dame. And here's why. He can't be a five technique. He, he just can't. He could maybe be a three, four D end if, if you needed him to be. I believe he's a 4-3-3 a three, three technique, and he's going to be a little bit like Sharif Floyd was. Uh, he's going to be a late round or a late first round pick, in my opinion, the 25 to 31 range, because we don't have a 30 second pick this year because New England had to nullify theirs due to Deflate Gate. I think he can go in that range. Now, if he tests well and has a very good pro day. And if teams like him, who knows? Especially if the way the board falls, this is a guy that could probably creep into the top 20. Um, but, oh, man, you want to watch a guy who can, who's a natural pass rusher as a three technique? This is your guy. Mm -hmm. You want to watch, a, you want to watch a, a technician put on the Texas tape. It is beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. And this is uh, this is, this uh... is this is Sheldon Day from Notre Dame. Yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, Day is, is really good too. I, I like him a lot, and he's a guy who's I think 
when you showed me the, you know a little bit of tape of them earlier, I think that's when I started to get interested in watching a little bit. And I haven't, still haven't seen a ton, but I like him a lot, and I like his uh, his athleticism and his size is impressive. Yeah, like I said, the way he can move as a pass rusher, and most importantly, I like the fact that for how big he is, he's you know 280 pounds, he moves extremely well, and he has very good recognition skills. Uh, he sees screens very well. Like I said, I'm kind of enamored. As a defensive lineman, my group, this is the guy that I like the most. I, I think he can potentially uh, be the best out of all of them when it's all said and done as a three technique. Um, and that's pretty high because a lot of people are saying Kim Dietschy is a guy who's maybe two years away from being a Pro Bowl type player uh, once, he, once he gets into the league. But there's something about Sheldon Day when you watch his tape you will see why a lot of guys like him, but why people are kind of holding off on him. And I'm glad people are doing that because it'll be great for me to kind of pull the Joey Boza shrug and say, you know, I told you so uh, when people start talking about him. Um, Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, but I have to hear who's in your top five. Okay, so we're talking just defensive uh, linemen here, or did you? Because I don't know if we you want to talk about just defensive uh, linemen, then go to edge guys, or did yeah, we mix yeah, something we'll in there? Go, uh, yeah, you can go your D tackles. I basically just broke it up. I went two top fives. Uh, I went D tackle, then yeah, edge. Okay, um, perfect. Uh, all right, well, you know, if we get started with uh, defensive tackles, uh, I gotta put him here because he is criminally underappreciated. Austin Johnson is my number one defensive tackle. Uh, everyone was enamored with uh, Danny Sheldon last year. Now, these two are not the same guy. They're not the same athlete. You want to know why? Because Austin Johnson is smarter. <laughs> you know, and, and not only is he smarter, but he's also um, – He's not quite as rangy as Sheldon was because he had a special type of range, but I argue that he may be more powerful. Uh, One thing you see in his tape is, A, he's intelligent. I've never seen a guy playing one tech as knowledgeable, as as quick to snuff out a screen as him. He's smart. Whenever you're throwing a screen, he knows before the edge guys do, before the defensive ends do, and he's almost there before they are too because he's so intelligent. Uh, He can anchor. He fights against double teams well. He knows how to fight through double teams. Austin Johnson's a guy who um, I think uh, also has good hand usage. You'll see a little bit of a rip, a little bit of a swim move. So you can uh, you can do a lot of things with him. I feel like if you put him at a true nose, you don't really get that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you get that that true uh, edge rusher. Uh, not that true. You don't get that true uh, defensive tackle, uh, penetrating defensive tackle that Austin Johnson can be as big as he is. But he's my number one guy. Okay, number two. I really like – I'm not going to put Andrew Billings in here because he simply um, – he simply uh, – it's not confirmed whether he'll come out or not. Uh, I really want to put him in here, but I'd I rather deal on what's for sure rather than what's not. So I'm, I'm not going to put him in here. Uh, number two is Kenny Clark. Uh, he's an awesome penetrating defensive tackle. Um, I mean, you've shown me some tape of him. I've looked at some other tape of him. Uh, Clark can play. He's another p- penetrating defensive tackle. Can play with power, play with some pop. I like him a lot, and he's also quicker than I think people give him credit for. Uh, number three, uh, in the defensive tackle mode, uh, well, if we go D lineman rather than edge, I'm going to toss you guys. Uh, I'm going to give you Sheldon Day at three. I like him a lot. I think he's really good. Um, um, but he's he's really good, and I think he's talented. And I think uh, one of the things people don't see is uh, because of the role he plays, he doesn't take full advantage of his athleticism. But I think he's capable of more than people think. Uh, also, number four, I'm going to throw out Dolphus Washington in there. People need to get hip to him. Josh, we talked about him yesterday. I yeah. finished his tape today, or I finished you know a decent amount of his tape today. Um, the funny thing is, last year Ohio State's had a you know a big identity crisis at defensive tackle. Last year we had uh, Michael Bennett, three tech body playing one tech. This year we've got one tech body and other office Washington playing three tech. But the funny part is, I really think he's great at either. Bennett kind of struggled playing both. Washington is very versatile. Uh, his size and power would probably say yes. You're getting uh, uh, maybe a, a shade or one tech, and yeah, you can't lose playing him there. 
but he can penetrate too. Now he doesn't always do it. I think every now and then he'll reach back and do some things, but he he gives you a little slap and rip, or he'll give you. He even gave uh, Penn State a spin move, which is pretty nasty. So uh, he'll mix it up, and I like him a lot too. Uh, number five, I like Dean Lowry. Uh, out of Northwestern. That's a defensive lineman. He's technically a defensive end in there, but I'm not going to give him an edge rusher role because I think his true fit in the NFL is as a five technique. So he will play along the defensive line, not necessarily a, you know, a, a big-time defensive end or stand-up type dude. Um, he's powerful at the point of attack. He's a run-stopping defensive end. And uh, I think he's you know he's got great length. He's every bit of the 6'6" or maybe 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, people say he is, and he's probably about 292. Uh, so he, he's somewhere in that uh, that power, 5-tech, 2-gap athleticism range, so I'm going to put him there. When it comes to edge rushers, uh, we talked about it. Right now, I'm going to defer to Forrest. Or, yeah, I'm going to defer to DeForest Buckner right now at 1. His production is special. His tape has been great, too. I didn't like him so much in the Michigan State game because I thought he'd be able to run all over Zach Conklin. And in the second half, we saw some of what I thought we'd see. Um, number two is Sean Oakman. Uh, Sean Oakman is the bully of the South. He is that 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 kid that takes your lunch money and beats you up. Uh, anytime you're in a one-on-one situation with him, it's 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 over before it even begins. For a guy his size, he's very quick off the snap, and if he does with his power beat a tackle off the snap, it just uh, you know it's like watching Animal Planet at that point. You know it, it's over. He's, he's going to get you. He's going to get you on the ground. He's going to tackle your quarterback. He's going to ruin your quarterback's day. Sean Oakman is powerful. He's productive. And I think a lot of people haven't taken the time to look at his tape from this year. Please do it. He's awesome. Um, also, Edge guys. Uh, this is really tough. I mean, I'm going to put Lawson in there the same way you did. Uh, I like him a lot um, uh, over at Clemson. And he's a guy who's a special athlete to me as well. And I think. If you put him in the mix as an edge rusher, I think he's going to be very well. I think he's going to do very well. And I got him as my three. Uh, he, to me, he seems like a special type of athlete because his production has been good. And uh, I think he's a, uh, he rounds everything out nicely at three. And number four, Georgia has a guy. It's uh, Which one, Jordan Jenkins? The other dude. Who's the other guy? Leonard Floyd. Ooh. Yeah, give me give me Leonard Floyd. Give me Leonard Floyd right now. Um, I might regret this later. I got to look at more tape. But uh, Jenkins, I've seen him single block by a tight end a lot. So I'm not completely sure. And uh, it, it's really crazy. So um, so I, I've got him. And whew, number five, I've got Joe. Actually, we should do this over. Before yep. Lawson and before uh, – in between Lawson and uh, – I think I gave – let me see, Lawson and Jenkins. Give me Joe Schobert at three. I like him a lot. He's the edge rusher out of Wisconsin. Uh, I got him at three because he's – All right. Oh, All right. yes. Oh, yes. Hold on a sec. Before – you cannot say like. Montel, you love this guy. <laughs> you well, love people, this. people don't you know love yet. This guy's yeah. Yes. You love he's this he's great. He's great, and because, you know, we did our conference database and everything, Josh, and when you look at it, basically the way it goes is I had Vincent Baigo as a dude to watch in that defensive line. Uh, Schobert wasn't uh, as big last year. He wasn't as uh, as productive last year, so I, I didn't uh, give him the same attention. But when I started watching the tape for Baigo, you know, Schobert just jumped right off the tape, and then a week later everyone loves Joe Schobert, and it's like, well, duh, because he's extremely productive. Uh, all I have to say is when you watch the tape between the two, you know, it's kind of like when you're, you know, when you're dating, right? There's the one dude who's texting a girl, right? There's a dude who's texting and flirting with a girl. And then there's another dude who's, uh, who's sleeping with a girl, you know, you know, uh, Joe <laughs> Sobert is sleeping with a girl, you know, he's, he's got her in the bag, you know, uh, Vincent Bagel is calling, texting, wondering why he's not getting any responses. But with all due respect, Bagel's a, a great athlete too. I don't think he gets enough credit and he's had solid production. It's just more of a testament to how awesome and freakish I think Joe Sobert has. He's a fluid athlete. Like I said, he's not zero to 100. He's not doing a hundred. He's doing a consistent 70 throughout. He's powerful. And, and uh, he just uh, – his mind never sleeps when he's on the football field. So got to give credit to Schobert. Sorry I went on a little bit of a tangent there. But Joe Schobert, when he gets to the combine, he will make a believer out of you all. I think he has 
power no one's seen before. Not maybe not before, but out of this class before. And uh, I think he's going to be fairly fast too. Yeah. So so rerun your top five. Rerun your top five for me. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so at one, I've got DeForest Buckner. Two, I've got Sean Oakman. Three, I've got Joe Schobert. Four, I've got uh, – oh, four, I've got Lawson out of Clemson. And then five, I've got uh, Jordan uh, – no. I've got Leonard Floyd at five. That's mm-hmm. it. Okay. Uh, yep, there we go. Yeah, all right. So here we go. Here we go. When we get through this, I am going to ask you a sleeper of each because I – Dude, my mind's been running a million miles an hour, uh, you listing these. But here's my number one. Uh, Montel, I know why you left him off the list, but I'm going to put him on the list because it's inevitable. My number one edge rusher is Joey Boza. I mean, it, it's undoubtable. I mean, I, do I really have to can, – can Yeah, I, I should have – yeah, just to make it clear, I, I, I should have – Throwing Bosa in there, I was thinking stand up edge rusher, but you're right, totally right. Bosa de- uh, deserves to be in the mixes too, and for kind well, of I mean, defensive end. Like I said, I, yeah. I know why you I know why you kept him off the list. Truly, it wasn't the fact that he's a stand up rusher; it's the fact that it's unanimous, bro. If anybody is going to argue with either of us right now that Joey Bosa is not the best pass rusher in this class, best defensive end in this class, and hell, maybe even the best prospect in this class. I don't I don't even know what to do. I just my mind would probably explode. So I understand why you left him off. So I understand where you're at there. Uh but I got to put him on. This dude's unbelievable, man. Uh you, Montel, we've been working together for almost 2 years now. You know what I love watching in tape that is physical, aggressive and power out of defensive linemen. Dude, this guy has it all. You go back and watch the Illinois game. Just go ahead and watch the Illinois game for one snap. All you have to do is type in Joey Boza Vine. It's okay because it's been, it's been seen 100,000 times. It is unbelievable. Pure bull rush through the right tackle, through the quarterback, and it tripped up the running back. And he made the play. But the thing that I like about him the most Everybody talks about him on the outside. He's been proving that he can play inside, too. Uh, the Penn State game. Boy, white guard, hard down block. They're trying to run wham. That guard's pulling back. He shoves it, you know, keeps his outside arm free, and then tackles the running back in the backfield. And actually, I shouldn't even say tackle, destroyed him. It was a four-yard loss. I mean, his technique is phenomenal. So I love Joey Boza. He's my number one player on the board. Um, he's been quietly creeping up there um, since I've started watching this season, and now I know why he's the number one player on my board and I'm the number one on everybody's board. The dude's damn talented. Number two, Montel, this guy, and I think you could probably agree with me, I don't necessarily know what we could truly do with him, but that's DeForest Buckner. He's six seven two ninety. He's athletic enough to play on the edge, but he's also big and strong enough and has the leverage to play inside. If he's going to stay in a 4-3 system, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he'd be a great 4-3 D end. Who knows? Maybe a team, you could play him as a three technique. I don't necessarily think he's as good as as a true three technique um, as Eric Armstead was. But, I mean, it's amazing what NFL defensive line coaches can do. They're so good at developing talent. And I'm not going to lie, I would not be upset at all if he went to Minnesota. I mean, I know we have great D linemen, but let's just keep creating a stockpile of great D linemen in Minnesota. Uh, But I'm going to stop there. Sean Oakman. Now, he's my wild card. He's my number three, but he's my wild card. Everything Montel said was exactly right. Freakishly strong, freakishly built. I mean, what, he's 6'9"? Six, is he 6'9"? Six, nine? Six, nine, I don't think he's a 6'8". I think he's a 6'8", and he's, and he's 280. I don't, I don't think he's the full 290. Sean Oman's maybe 6'8", 285, somewhere in that range. But I, but I love him. His motor as a pass rusher is really good. We talked about earlier in the show with 
Buckner learning how to use his hands. Oakman's known how to use his hands for a while. Uh, but this year, the speed and just the fluidity of understanding, all right, if the tackle hits me here, I can hit him with this to counter it. His moves have become more than just, all right, bull rush, now rip. All right, he stopped me. I'm just going to try and get in the quarterback's vision. He's doing a very good job of putting more than one move together, and that's why we're seeing some of the success as a pass rusher with him this year. The only thing I am a little concerned about is he's not as strong in the run game at times. Um, He doesn't keep a strong base. There are times where he plays, we call it pigeon-footed, so he keeps his feet uh, together and basically just overpowered. Uh, But overall, you get this guy into an NFL program or an NFL Mm -hmm. franchise, they're going to develop him, plain and simple. Uh, number three is Shaq Lawson. I mean, the, Clemson's been producing pass rushers, I mean, for years. You go Gaines Adams, Daquan Bowers. You know, you had Grady Jarrett and Vic Beasley come out of there last year. You're going to have Lawson come out of there this year. They're going to have a guy come out next year because he's only a sophomore this year. I mean, they're doing a good job of developing pass rushers. The thing with Lawson, it's kind of like Sheldon Day. He's very good recognition skills. He's a very good pass rusher. But the thing I like about him the most is that Clemson Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can be more dynamic. They make him stand up. So there are snaps where he has to travel with a tight end when the tight end trades on the formation, and he stands up in a two-point. There are plays where he drops into the flats and plays in the flats. He's extremely athletic for a guy who's six three and a half, two seventy five. Number five is a guy that came on to me late, but I really, really like this kid. And Montel, I know you do too, because you've been you've been crushing on the Big Ten pass rushers hard this year. Carl Nassib. I really like this kid. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I think and, gonna, yeah. I think he's going to test extremely well. He's pretty raw yeah. in terms of a pass rusher. Uh, I believe, you know, just from watching his tape, his hands don't necessarily follow his feet all the time. But the one thing you love out of defensive linemen is if their motor is constantly 100%. Mm-hmm. And he is a guy that goes 0 to 100 the moment the ball is snapped. Exactly. His hands might, his hands might not catch up with his feet, but he gets off the ball so fast that he doesn't have to worry about you know, fighting hands, he can hit a, a quick little speed rush. And he is fairly athletic. He does show good bend on the end. Um, I am going to be anxious to see if they ask him to stand up and do those outside linebacker drills because just with his build, I am a little nervous to think that his hips might be a little stiff, which obviously people know that that's tough when you're trying to drop into coverage. Um, that could limit him a little bit. But other than that, this kid's really good. Um, I do, however, want to give you two sleepers. Um, uh, a little note here on Nassib. I'm sorry to jump in here, but a little note on Nassib. I love him a lot. Uh, I think he's going to show up big time in the combine, too. I think he's powerful. I think he's got awesome straight line speed. And I, Twitter is awful with narratives. People say something about a player, and everyone sees it to be universally true. Don't be a follower, guys. Carl Nassib is awesome. Um, I kept him out of my top five list because, I don't know, something, sometimes it just doesn't trigger um, in my mind yet until combine to kind of go out on a limb for the guys I love. But, Josh, you know how I feel about Joe Schobert and Carl Nassib. It, it really yeah. goes without saying. <laughs> it, it goes without saying. Well, and that's, why, and that's why I can't wait for you to, and I'm sure you've done it a little bit, but when you dive into Kimiko uh, Torre, I know you're going to like this kid too. Um, oh, Kimiko Torre? Explosive. Yes, this is a guy. Yeah, yeah. He's, dude. I mean, hell, we can spend ten minutes talking about Big Ten pass rushers: Shalik Calhoun, Drew Ott, Jihad Ward from Illinois. You know, NASA, Washington, Zettel. I mean, the Big Ten is loaded this year with quality defensive linemen. Um, but Torre is another one of those guys that I really like. Um, I want to go back because I. I I mean, why not? I just told you that the defensive line is loaded for the Big Ten. A guy that I want everybody to keep their minds on heading into combine prep and maybe even the all-star games is Malik Collins from Nebraska. 
Um, this dude is something else. Um, he's a little inconsistent at times. Not the greatest pass rusher when his first move gets stopped. He's one of those guys that tries to hit you with a quick you know, shimmy at the line of scrimmage to get you off balance and then pressure through. But his run defense is very good. He has a very good first step. Um, there's a matter of fact, there's a play against Wisconsin. He pinch steps, and he basically beats the guard. And he was a three technique. It's very hard for defensive linemen if a guard is really good. And it was an All-American right guard. Uh, matter of fact, he just got invited to uh, the Senior Bowl, which we'll be talking about here in a second. Beat him across mm-hmm. his face. Didn't slingshot behind. Beat him across his face. And had mm-hmm. he have had two more steps laterally instead of trying to pursue downfield, would have been a hell of a play because it would have been about a six- or seven-yard loss. That, but that's the thing that he can do. Um, he's very good with his hands. The biggest thing is how much does he love football? And now that's a question that obviously is hard to ask, but it's true. Look at the way his body type changed from when he was a junior to a senior. Um, I'm not going to throw any shade at all on that Nebraska training athletic training staff or that strength and conditioning staff because, I mean, you look at their numbers, their numbers are impressive. But though his body type has changed from when he was a junior to when he was a senior. A little bit more husky, has a little bit more fat, you know, in his belly. Not as not as broad as I wanted him to be this year coming in. Um, you know, there were rumors that he was trimmed up and looked great in training camp. Whoever said that what must have been watching, you know, from back to the future because he doesn't look like the same player. So is he going to be a guy that comes into the combine in shape and kills it? Or is he going to be a guy that kind of goes through the motions, you know, does the great workouts, but doesn't necessarily take, the nutrition seriously, and it's going to hurt his grade. Because right now, he's a top 50 pick in my in my book. Uh, not necessarily over 50, not necessarily under 50. I'd say that if pick 50 had to be made in terms of best player available on my board, Malik Collins would be player number 50. The only thing he can do is improve himself, and the biggest way that he needs to improve himself is not necessarily through his tape, but through his physical actions. If he gets his body in shape heading into the combine, which we've talked about plenty of times is very crucial, he's going to be damn good. And I'm telling you, people are going to catch on to this kid, and they're going to like him a lot. So keep Malik Collins in the back of your mind a little bit too. Yeah, of course. Uh, Josh, you know, he's got great length. He's powerful. Um, I wish his ball awareness was a little bit better, but yeah, Collins is someone to watch. I really want to. I'll, if he stayed one more year, I think it'd be incredible the development. But right now, yeah, he, he's a good well, I think he's, raw uh, prospect. I think he is a senior this year. Is he really? Think, yes, I think okay, he is okay. a senior. Oh um, uh, yeah. Well, if, if that's true, then yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, he's a senior because Vincent Valentine is a junior. Um, I got gotcha. gotcha. But I mean, like, but like I said before, Montel. We could literally spend the rest of the show talking about just how solid the Big Ten defensive lines are, um, mm. but we got to get into you know getting in a little bit of premature talk on the Senior Bowl, um, of course. because there were a couple notable names that have been invited and that have been accepted. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, do you know? Have you heard of any of the uh, acceptance so far? Uh, okay. I know Shrine Game is Senior Bowl, so forgive me, but I just it, it's meshed into one big list in my head. Okay, I believe Carson Wentz is going into Senior Bowl. Is that correct? Yes. Or at least got an invite. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Montel, because I'm actually going to read it off right now. I was typing oh. it up because I just wrote out the notables. Uh, here's the notable for you guys, folks: Carson Wentz, quarterback in North Dakota State, the four-time defending uh, FCS national champions, defensive end Charles Tapper from Oklahoma, defensive lineman Sheldon Rankins from Louisville, and defensive end Jordan Jenkins from Georgia. Those are the notable names, but here's some other notable names. All right. You have Evan Bohm, a guard, 6'3", 220, from Missouri. You have James Bradbury, 
Defense corner, 6'1", 213 from Sanford. Sean Davis, corner from Maryland. Josh Garrett, guard, Stanford. Uh, Matt Io Dennis from Temple. Montel, you might know that name better than I do. 6'4", 292-pound defensive lineman. Uh, Jordan uh, Jenkins. Matt, you, you Adonis or something like that? Yes, Matty yes, yeah. Matty Adonis, yep. Uh, Jordan Jenkins, obviously. Uh, we already said him from Georgia. Um, I'm going to hold off on some of the on these two notable FCS names because I want to get into a little bit more with them because I've actually been watching some tape on them. Uh, but Jay Lee, wide receiver from Baylor. Blake Martinez, a linebacker from Stanford. This kid can play. Uh, this kid's pretty damn good. As well as Tyre uh, Matikovich from Temple. <laughs> this kid has Oh, a yeah, Tyre Matikovich. I mean, we've talked this, about him, Josh. And this kid's damn good, too. Malcolm Mitchell, uh, Georgia. Uh, Cole Toner, 6'6", 303-pound offensive lineman from Harvard. Uh, Dan Vitell, fullback from Northwestern. Jihad Ward, defensive end from Illinois. Carson Wentz, North Dakota State. Bryce Williams, tight end, East Carolina. But there's two notable names, Montel, that I wanted to bring up because they're actually pretty damn good football players. Um, I've dug into their tape a little bit this year. DeAndre Hall from Northern Iowa, he's a cornerback. This kid is going to have a very good weekend down in Mobile. And the other one is Miles Killebrew, a safety from Southern Utah mm-hmm. University. Damn good football players as well. Um, so when you want to talk about, I mean, we talk about the senior ball all the time. People who talk about uh, college football or read about the NFL draft know just how important the senior bowl is. Um, just for these two players alone that have already declared, you know, or accepted their invite to be FCS players that aren't as notable names as a Carson Wentz, this is a huge weekend for them. Um, If they show that they can do everything right, uh, particularly in NFL secondaries, which next to quarterback is probably one of the hardest positions to transition to is playing corner, they could have very, very good draft stock heading into the combine or maybe even get a combine invite off of their performance at the Senior Bowl. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I'm hoping they do. The NFL kind of, you know, well, we'll probably get into this more. We didn't talk about it as much in the past. They tend to invite the wrong FCS prospects to the combine. And then when they go there and bomb, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, FCS, that small school guy. <laughs> I mean, I really hope they invite some great athletes is more the point. I want to see Javon Hargrave get invited there. I want to see Don Cherry get invited there. Uh, I want to see some guys that can really blow things up. Now, they did a great job in inviting up Marpet. And I also think uh, oof, that Zenner, receiver Zach from – yeah, yep, Zach Zenner, of course. And he went there, uh, tested uh, tested better than almost half the backs and still didn't get drafted, right? Yeah, I think yep. he's still a UDFA. So that's, yeah. we, we've been through that too. It's ridiculous. Um, but they really need to go about their FCS uh, qualifications better. They wound up inviting that uh, – oh, he's such a bum. Uh, Gus Johnson. Whew. He tested oh, below oh, average in nearly every awesome. category. Yep, he, yeah. he's 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 very below average. He's a bum. So um, yeah, they just they got to do it right this time. That's all I'm saying. Hey, you know what I completely agree with you. Uh, obviously, the Senior Bowl is exactly how it sounds. It's for what Phil Savage and the rest of his staff believes are the top senior prospects uh, for the National Football League. A uh, couple notable names that have had invites, uh, I believe Shalee Calhoun was one, Sean Oakman, Connor Cook, DeForest Buckner. Those were all four notable names that I saw on Twitter that have been indeed and confirmed to have invitations. Uh, Jonathan Williams, the injured running back from Arkansas, also had an uh, invite there. That's going to be a big weekend for him. When he accepts that, because he's going to be fully healthy by now, that will be a huge weekend for him. Um, you know, you can expect that. And he's going to be another guy to watch. And, again, as we talked about with running back, that's going to help him heading into the combine. You know, that's going to help knock a little bit of dust off for him. Um, obviously, he's coming back from that uh, ACL 
So it'll be good to watch him. Uh, but I believe, because I, I love watching competition, and we saw it last year with Danny Shelton being there, Ali Marpet, uh, Shaq Thomas, mm-hmm. you know, the um, the guard from Georgia Tech, or, uh, or Shaq Mason, excuse me, Shaq Thomas, uh, Shaq Mason, I want to see Shalit Calhoun and DeForest Buckner accept, well, and Sean Oakman to be included, accept their invite down there. The reason being, they're going to be going up against offensive linemen that they probably haven't faced, and it'll be interesting to see, particularly for me in the pass rush drill, how they do. You know, that, that I love the pass rush drill. You know, it, it, that mm-hmm. is a true mm-hmm. nut-up nut up type moment. When it's a one-on-one type situation, you're going to see who's the batter dude. And Grady Jarrett last year, he was a bad dude. When Aaron Donald was there, I think everybody can agree, he was a bad dude. Danny Shelton was the same way. He had so many battles with Shaq Mason. And matter of fact, I would be willing to say that, you know, before we even get in more to this, the Senior Bowl is so important. Look at Lakeland Tomlinson last year. Who the hell yeah. was this? Had a great senior bowl, had a great workout. Then he was a well, 23. He put together a great season and a great career, too. I mean, I can't say he just came out of nowhere. <laughs> um, but guys like... Well, no, he didn't come out of nowhere, but he was, before the senior bowl performance and how well he did that week, he was not a guy that was being considered to be a, a first-round pick. And he was a top 100 guy. But to me, in my opinion, he was still there. Um, he was still a second and third round pick. I just think first round desperate happened. <laughs> but um, but people did make him more of a top fifty guy. That's what I did see. Um, yeah. Um, but for but, but for uh, you, Mike, out of that list that I named of Connor Cook, Buckner, Oakman, and Calhoun, you know, I obviously said my opinions on those D linemen. But I know you've watched enough Connor Cook as well this year. Do you think it's imperative for him to accept the invite to go down there this weekend? And who knows, maybe separate himself from an underclassman in Jared Goff to be, you know, QB1 for this class. Uh, Yeah, I mean, Cook, uh, you know, he's a solid prospect. In all seriousness, I don't know how much he actually has to gain from the Senior Bowl. I think golf could impress more, but who, a lot of people already hold Cook in very high regard. I don't believe he's in the top two quarterbacks of this draft, so I'm actually the naysayer in this group. But the consensus is that I'm pretty sure he is in most NFL scouts' eyes. So if he goes there and plays great, um, maybe it locks it down. Maybe he can beat out Paxton Lynch. Cool. But, uh, you know, I don't uh, I don't know if he has a ton of game, but I hope he plays and show up, shows up and does great. I think uh, he's got a great head on his shoulders. He's going to pass the eye test for sure. He's going to – him and Shalik A. Calhoun, both uh, guys I interviewed at Big Ten Media Days, their personalities are awesome, hard workers. Calhoun especially is brilliant. Um, and I think people are going to love to pick his brain and talk football with him. He's a very personable speaker. You know, you can kick it and chill with him, and you can also talk football. Uh, so I think his personality might win some scouts over as well. Um, but I don't know what his upside is yet, so there's that. But, no, these guys are all going to show up. Oakman, uh, I think once scouts actually get on the ground and be on the, in the same playing field as Sean Oakman, and they actually look at this guy, like like see this mammoth human being, it's over. Everyone's going to be saying he's a top 10 pick. I guarantee it. Now, I'm not saying he is a top 10 pick. I'm telling you that once people see how big and strong this man is in person, it's over. It is. All he's got to do is test well after that. Yeah. Yeah, he certainly is going to pass the eye test for that. And I, I like what you said about Connor Cook, um, you know, because somebody from Draft Nation, you know, Said when I when I said Goff, quickly corrected me and said or Paxton Lynch, um, but I like what you said about Goff, or excuse me Cook as to where you know his personality is going to help NFL coaches and scouts kind of get to understand him a little bit more. You look at some of the rumors that I've been swirling about Connor Cook right now as the reason of him not being voted a captain as a senior is maybe because of some issues like that. So I think maybe 
this type of environment where it's players that he doesn't necessarily know on a friend-to-friend basis, if he comes in and, and takes control of the offense, no matter what team he gets put onto, if he comes in and controls that offense, it'll be very good for him in, in terms of scout sizes. I, I agree completely. You're right. Um, I know we're running a little long here, but what else? You no, got? yeah, yeah, completely agree with you. Uh, you know, we had to we had to get that part in. Uh, but as Montel, you know, pointed out to all of us, we are starting to to run a little bit close to our time. Um, quick little NFL tidbit. Um, obviously, everybody knows the news that Brock Osweiler is going to be taking the start for Peyton Manning this weekend on Sunday. As a Montanan and as a guy who played against Brock in high school, I cannot say that I'm uh, anything less than excited to see how he plays. Uh, Hopefully he can put Montana on the map. And in terms of being a quarterback, do a little bit better job of representing us than Ryan Leaf did. Because Ryan Leaf, I think everybody knows, didn't represent us very well in the NFL. Um, So best of luck to Brock. And... I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Montel, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, you know, we're going to get back at it next week as always. We'll be here same time, same place. Obviously, more than likely, hopefully we won't have to rant again about the fact that Iowa got, you know, people are talking bad about Iowa or who knows, maybe if I believe a team is getting hosed, like maybe in Oklahoma State, uh, you know, we'll see what happens here. But huge week in college football. Hope you guys all enjoy it. Montel, as always, great job, my friend. Everybody who is a part of Draft Nation this evening for both either my feed or Montel's feed, thank you very much for being interactive and enjoying uh, coming in with us. It was a lot of fun. Hope you guys have yourselves a great night, great rest of your week, a great weekend of college football and NFL football. Other than that, same time next week for NGSC Sports Radio. I'm Joshua Zimmer and Montel Hardy signing off. You guys have yourselves a great night. Thank you.